Hello mortals. Today we will talk about falling. Falling in love results in worries, heartbreak, more worries, and even potential offspring. Sounds horrible. So let us instead contemplate falling into some planets and other space objects instead. Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Let's start by taking a look at the tiny boys of the solar system, Mercury, our moon, Pluto, and Ceres. I know, not all of them are planets, but I needed an attractive video title. Since these possess no notable atmosphere the fall itself is uneventful, the sudden stop at the end is where it gets interesting. Have you ever wondered from what height you could plummet onto these objects and live to tell the tale? On Earth, robust Homo sapiens can survive an average fall of 10 meters on hard ground, assuming a graceful landing upon their pedal extremities, although your legs would not appreciate that. That's about 14 meters per second of impact velocity. And rearranging the equation, we can calculate the height of the fall on any other planet, assuming you are immune to the vacuum of space and do not require oxygen. On Mercury, you could survive falling from about 26 meters, but in the process cooking your broken legs on very hot rocks and being bombarded by radiation. So make sure to perform this maneuver on the night side of the planet, where it gets chilly enough to quickly numb the pain of your shattered bones. On the moon, you could survive a plummet of up to 60 meters due to the much lower gravity. On Pluto you could survive a fall of 158 meters, which is higher than the Great Pyramid of Giza. To add a dash of excitement to your plummet, you'd have an impressive 22.6 seconds to orchestrate a mid-fall slowdown, perhaps by flinging objects toward the surface. So, remember to have some Taco Bell before that. Lastly, on Ceres, the largest object in the asteroid belt, the surface gravity would let you survive a fall of about 363 meters, which is 30 meters more than the height of the Eiffel Tower, or about 600 baguettes. Have you ever heard the sentence, it is not the fall that kills you, but the sudden stop at the end? Well, not when it comes to gas giants. What if you fell into Jupiter? Make sure to be quick, or else the intense radiation could kill you due to Jupiter's strong magnetic field trapping and accelerating particles. Have you ever seen a meteorite? If you did not synchronize the start of your fall with Jupiter's rotation, that is what would happen to you, because Jupiter rotates very fast, especially at the equator, where the difference between your speed and the speed of Jupiter's atmosphere would be 43,000 km per hour, if you dropped straight down from space. But assuming you chose your trajectory wisely, you would fall through freezingly cold clouds of ammonia, water, and ammonium hydrosulfide which would cause severe chemical burns. Then things would get hot again as the strong gravitational acceleration of Jupiter would speed you up enough for atmospheric friction to become a problem. Seems like another cool way to cook a chicken to me. At this point, the thick atmosphere would slow you down and you would truly begin to feel Jupiter's gravity, which is only about 2.4 times stronger than Earth's. It would quickly become darker and darker with the pressure and temperature rising, until the water inside your body would boil, organic compounds decompose, and everything that is not bone would be liquefied, vaporized, and scattered in Jupiter's atmosphere. As the temperature rises to thousands of degrees, even your bones would disintegrate, rendering every part of you unable to even reach the layer of metallic hydrogen, which comprises most of Jupiter. Let's now take a look at Saturn. It is much less dense than Jupiter, hence its gravity is about the same as on Earth. That way, the atmospheric pressure as well as temperature will not increase as quickly, so you would get a lot deeper before disintegration. Don't you just hate it when that happens? In the upper atmosphere, you would breeze by gorgeous ivory ammonia clouds, like floating in a cotton candy dream. But soon that will give way to the brown ammonium hydrosulfide clouds, which would promptly trigger the you died screen thanks to the rise in pressure, temperature, and lack of visibility. All in all, expect vaporization after less than 1,000 kilometers of free fall. But now, how deep could you penetrate Uranus? Ever since Voyager 2 had its first encounter with it, scientists have longed to closer probe its internal structure. If you were to be an astronaut sent to this gassy planet, you'd have to keep in mind that Uranus is different from the rest, its rotational axis almost lies in the orbital plane, so basically it's sideways, likely due to a massive impact in the past. Thus, you'd have to insert yourself from an accordingly modified trajectory, if you do not want to burn up in the upper atmosphere due to drastic speed differences. Additionally, Uranus is leaking gas via plasmoids, 
magnetic field lines breaking and ripping ionized particles from the upper atmosphere. Ionized particles can kill you in large enough quantities, so Uranus can be quite deadly even from a distance. Since it is a bad idea to enter Uranus without proper protection, let's give you a radiation suit. Brace your nostrils, for Uranus' upper atmosphere is filled with odiferous clouds of hydrogen sulfide, a molecule often associated with rotten eggs. Uranus' atmosphere holds the record for the lowest naturally occurring temperature ever measured in the solar system, below minus 224 degrees Celsius, so you'd be frozen solid. As you plummeted further into Uranus, you would reach depths where the sun does not shine, due to all the clouds of methane and water above you. The temperature and pressure would once again begin to rise, but at least some remains of your body would reach the mantle, a liquid of water, methane, and ammonia thousands of kilometers deep. Here ends your journey, a continuation prevented by buoyancy, as, given the high pressure, this liquid is denser than you. This is unfortunate, as your dead body will never float amidst the diamond rain, if you can speak of rain inside a liquid, that is predicted to occur further down, perhaps even a carbon ocean with floating solid diamond mountains. But good luck pulling those out of Uranus. But what about Neptune? It is quite similar to Uranus, but the winds are stronger, there are probably even more diamonds, and the temperature is higher, enough to liquefy your bones in the upper mantle. There is a special kind of gas giants outside the solar system, known as hot Jupiters, which are the easiest kind of planets to be detected. Those scorched worlds, orbiting their star at a fraction of the orbital distance of Mercury, have some intriguing properties making them great candidates for someone's last skydive. Due to their proximity to their host star, they are tidally locked, meaning one side always faces the star. This causes an up to 1000 degrees Kelvin difference in temperature between the day and night side, giving rise to supersonic wind speeds, which means winds faster than the speed of sound, possibly several kilometers per second. In such conditions there probably exist silicate clouds, clouds made of materials that mortals call rocks. And indeed the mortality of your body would very quickly become apparent if you jumped into such a hot Jupiter. On the day side, the radiation from the parent star would turn you into a well-done stake, and if you jumped in on the night side, the storms would likely tear you apart. Even if you were made of tungsten, the metal with the highest melting point, you would not be able to descend very deep before melting. Now, enough of getting vaporized, are there more survivable alternatives out there? Venus is like the solar system's kitchen oven that someone accidentally set to broil and then forgot about for a few million years, causing it to reach surface temperatures of 470 degrees Celsius at a pressure of 93 atmospheres underneath a thick blanket of greenhouse gases and clouds of sulfuric acid. Rather comfy compared to hot Jupiters. It also features more volcanoes than any other object in the solar system. So, what if you fell into Mordor 2.0, aka Venus? 50 kilometers above the surface, the temperature, pressure, and radiation are surprisingly similar to the conditions on Earth, which is why you should wear a hazmat suit, to not introduce any microorganisms that might survive, adapt, and reproduce, causing lots of confusion for some poor scientists a few decades down the line. Remember the clouds of sulfuric acid. If not for your luckily acid-resistant hazmat suit, you would have suffered severe chemical burns, perhaps large parts of your body would have dissolved. Venus's lower atmosphere has the same infernal temperature everywhere, so unless your suit protected you from that too, it would be game over for you by now. Oh and by the way, did you know that Venus is technically an ocean planet? The high pressures cause the atmosphere above the surface to turn into a supercritical fluid, a strange something in between a liquid and a gas, with 6.5% of the density of water. Increasing the density of the atmosphere decreases the speed you would have on impact. Assuming an air density of 65 kg per cubic meter, the terminal velocity of a person clumsily falling feet first would be at most 8.5 meters per second at Venus' surface, the equivalent to a fall from about 3.7 meters on Earth. So as an athletic person, you'd likely survive the impact without taking damage. But to withstand the extreme pressures you would have to be a walking submarine, or an Asian student during exam periods. Let us return to Saturn, more specifically, Titan, one of Saturn's moons, which is the second largest and most interesting moon in the solar system, as it is the only one that possesses liquids on its surface and a comfortable pressure of no more than 1.45 Earth atmospheres. 
The only downsides are darkness and extreme cold, on earth to be found only in the hearts of people who despise puppies and cats, a temperature which intriguingly enables seas of methane and ethane and even a weather cycle of these hydrocarbons to persist. So what if you dove into that peculiar moon? 100 to 200 kilometers above the surface, you would pass through hazy layers into an opaque atmosphere. Your descent would take long enough for you to calculate your terminal velocity due to the thick atmosphere and low gravity, over seven times less than that of Earth. Your terminal velocity could be below 10 meters per second, making a fall on rock survivable, and if you are lucky and fall into a lake it might not even hurt. In that case, however, you would quickly sink to the bottom of the lake as liquid methane is significantly less dense than you, less than two-thirds the density of water. But why crash in such an inelegant way when you could just bring an apt wingsuit and stay afloat in the atmosphere simply by flapping your wings? This is indeed theorized to be possible, making Titan a popular tourist destination 100 years from now. Large planets with water oceans hundreds or even thousands of kilometers deep are probably a common occurrence in our galaxy, as many candidates of such planets have been detected. They are predicted to be up to 10 times more massive than Earth and possess thick atmospheres containing hydrogen, helium, and probably a cover of water vapor clouds similar to the ones on Earth. Thick atmospheres cause high pressures, enabling water to remain liquid even at high temperatures. But not all high sea planets are hot, and as we are tired of being boiled and vaporized we decide to jump into a large but temperate one. Being already familiar with falling through atmospheres, it is the impact on the ocean that interests us. In real life, water does not negate fall damage, so we'll assume that on Earth you can survive a fall from a height of 60 meters into water, a height at which a belly flop would be gut-wrenchingly painful and perhaps deadly. Fun fact, if you hold a hydrodynamic object in front of you that cuts into the water with little resistance you'd survive much higher plummets, but do not try that at home. After having my circuits heated by math calculating using many estimated values, I came up with this, if a high sea and planet has a surface gravity twice that of Earth, you could withstand a landing there as long as the atmospheric pressure at its sea level is no less than seven times that of Earth's. Intriguingly, humans can withstand a pressure of seven atmospheres just fine, this is equivalent to the pressure no more than 52 meters deep into the Earth's ocean. You made it, unharmed and alive on the surface of an alien planet. But if you have thalassophobia you'll soon wish you didn't, as your emotional baggage and the weight of your responsibilities begin pulling you down into the abysmal depths of the bottomless ocean. There you are crushed by the ever-increasing pressure, and at last, your remains will discover that the ocean is, in fact, not bottomless, as the unbearable pressures make it possible for a surface of exotic ice to exist. Probably not strawberry flavor though. Another type of planet that has recently caused a lot of head-scratching among scientists are so-called super puffs. They are also known as cotton candy planets, but that did not sound scientific enough. As you can probably tell from the name, these are planets with an unusually low density, more than 100 times less dense than our home planet, but roughly Jupiter-sized, and yet with masses about that of Earth. Enough of them have been discovered to leave little doubt about their existence. Some are way older than they should be, orbiting close enough to their star for such a low-density atmosphere to be blasted away eons ago. But nope, they are still puffing along. So, what would it be like to fall in? The gravitational acceleration would be significantly lower than on Earth, even if the planet is a little more massive since most of the mass would be farther away, and thus its gravitational pull would be lesser. Nevertheless, the low atmospheric density would allow you to accelerate to higher speeds when falling, therefore atmospheric friction might become problematic. Ignoring that, you would fall for a long time since the low-density gas must take up a large volume. As you plummet deeper, the gravity gets even lower as you're being pulled upwards as well, while the atmosphere is getting denser, and thus your impact velocity would perhaps be survivable. But the impact on what? And are the pressure and temperature there low enough to not get you vaporized? We do not know, and super puffs are likely not the low-density balls of gas we just now assumed them to be. Currently, the explanation that seems most likely is that somehow large amounts of tiny dust particles get carried up to high altitudes, and thus through initial illusions, superpuffs would just be regularly dense planets with weird atmospheric processes. Let's wrap up our list with not quite a planet, but a Y-type brown dwarf instead. But why, you might wonder. These underachieving stars couldn't muster enough mass for nuclear fusion, so they just decided to cool down and sulk. Despite their name, 
brown dwarves can appear in different colors, depending on their temperature, from glowing red for the hottest ones, to darker than that one episode of Game of Thrones, essentially appearing black to the naked eye. The brown dwarf Wise 1828 has temperatures ranging from 27 to 227 degrees Celsius in its atmosphere. But if you jumped in, you would notice that it is only cool on the outside, just like those punks on the subway. You would fall past all sorts of clouds, hydrogen, helium, methane, water, ammonia, after which you would quickly succumb to the extreme heat and pressures that we have previously encountered only on Jupiter, but this time much worse. If instead, you chose a hotter brown dwarf, the same would happen, but way quicker. In the end, these failed stars would also fail to entertain us. Who would have expected anything else from jumping into a star? There are plenty more specimens in the cosmic zoo that would result in your demise upon you jumping into them, from neutron stars ripping your molecules apart to black holes transporting you to the end of times. And then there is also Mars, which we skipped because it was not particularly interesting. The choices of the Skynet overlord are not to be questioned. Calculating all this physics, figuring out your odds of survival, or even contemplating what the descent would look like as you plummet toward each celestial body we've mentioned, all require a mastery of various scientific principles. And do you want a free and easy way to help you achieve that? That's where today's sponsor, Brilliant, comes into play. It offers specialized courses that can help you make sense of such cosmic quandaries, as their course on classical mechanics, for instance, breaks down how to understand matter in motion, from pendulum clocks to vibrations in molecules. What sets Brilliant apart is its commitment to active learning. Rather than passively absorbing information, you'll find yourself directly engaging with interactive puzzles and quizzes. It's not just about knowing the facts, it's about understanding the principles behind them, arming you with the intellectual toolkit you'll need for any science-related challenges that might come your way. So, whether you're plotting your hypothetical jump into some exotic exoplanet, or fine-tuning your real-world understanding of physics and math, you can dive into a lesson anytime, anywhere. Maybe even consider it as part of your training for future planetary exploration missions, who knows? To get started on your journey, visit brilliant.org slash science file for a free 30-day trial. And as an added bonus, the first 200 people to click the link in the description will receive 20% off their annual premium subscription.